Welcome to The Pipeline, an S&P Global Market Intelligence podcast that offers insights into the M&A and IPO landscape. I'm Joe Mantone, Head of U.S. Financial News at S&P Global Market Intelligence. In this episode, we'll focus on the banking sector and we'll showcase a variety of views from the investment community that were on full display at a briefing that was hosted by S&P Global Market Intelligence in New York City on May 18th. The event featured two panel discussions, one moderated by myself and the other by Nathan Stovall, who is the head of financial research at S&P Global Market Intelligence. And he also hosts the podcast called Street Talk, which takes a deep dive on banks. Nathan is joining me today, and we'll discuss what we learned at the event. But just to set the stage a bit, the banking sector is typically an active area for M&A activity. However, the deals have come to a near halt uh, this year as the industry has been dealing with turmoil stemming from liquidity issues and the fallout from higher interest rates. But as we'll hear, the panelists at the event expect bank M&A to ramp up once the dust settles on the industry. Before we hear from those panelists, however, let me kick it over to Nathan. Nathan, can you give an overview of your panel at the event? Joe, I kick things off during the, the two sessions we had with what we dubbed our investor sentiment panel. And it featured a, a group of members of the buy and sell side, including Greg Hertrick, the head of U.S. Depository Strategies at Nomura, Jonah Marcus, a partner portfolio manager at Endeavor Capital, and Chris McGrady, the head of U.S. Bank Research at KBW. We talked about current bank valuations, which as you'll hear, they believe do not reflect current fundamentals, how banks are reacting to the challenging operating environment that has put pressure on bank liquidity, and what those impacts would have on bank strategies, including M&A activity going forward. And then that really transitioned into your session, Joe. Yes, that's right, Nathan. My panel focused on bank fundamentals and potential changes to to regulation that we might see in the aftermath of the large bank failures. And the panel featured several members from the legal and investment banking community and also a policy expert. We had uh, Ben Azoff, who is a partner at the law firm Luce Gorman. And we also had Isaac Boltanski, who is the director of policy research at BTIG. And the other panelist was Bill Burgess, who is the co-head of financial services investment banking at Piper Sandler. The panelists talked about some regulatory changes that banks are already experiencing. And the panelists also touched on uh, some changes that we could expect to see going forward. And Bill Burgess offered an insider's account on what it was like advising the FDIC during the bridge bank sale process. And it was was a great discussion. And we kicked things off beginning the event, really talking about Q1 earnings and what it taught us about bank fundamentals and how that compared or really differed than, than the views of the market. And no doubt banks reported higher funding costs and modest liquidity pressures, but almost no deterioration in credit. One of the biggest concerns we're seeing today. And, and those trends really didn't sync with the bearish sentiment in the market today. Chris McGrady, the head of U.S. Bank Research at at KBW, really talked about the disconnect that exists between fundamentals that we're seeing between analysts and investors and how fear is really driving much of the investing activity in the market. And Greg Hertrick at Nomura really put a finer point on that and built on it, saying that investors were painting all banks with a broad brush. You may see some headlines. These headlines may not have anything to do with the solvency of these institutions. Um, if that is the role of the regulator, if that is the role of Congress, if that is the role of bank management, or frankly, if that is the role of broadly the media. So I I do think that where we are right now is uh, very similar to a Bob Ross painting in so far as uh, he's he's got his big brush out and uh, everybody's sort of swiping all the banks to the side uh, and I, I think that is a, irrational, and B, uh, is probably not how this all works. Our investor on the panel, Jonah Marcus at Endeavor, really had a similar take and, and thought that results didn't match fear in the market. But he also acknowledged, you know, we're not really out of the woods yet in terms of getting an all clear. And so we need more clarity 
around credit and things like commercial real estate, which is certainly weighing on many investors' minds at the current moment. Still, at the end of the day, while Jonah said you might face some headwinds in the near term and almost painted as a a show-me story, he said anyone taking a longer-term horizon should be long the bank sector at this point, just given how depressed bank valuations are. I think you need to be long the group, for sure, if you can take a horizon and not be judged on short-term performance. And the question is, can you get a better deal in three months or in six months? But generally in this period of time, I think you want to be not just contrarian for the sake of being contrarian, but I think it's contrarian and right if you own the right balance sheets management teams and revenue streams. And KBW's Chris McGrady really struck a similar chord. And he offered a a wide variety of metrics looking at bank multiples and, and just really painted a picture of how distressed the space is in terms of valuations. At current levels, he he noted that they were really comparable to what we saw both at the height of the pandemic as as well as the aftermath of the global financial crisis, which really, really struck me as as very, very depressed levels. But if you look back historically, the Jonas point about buying banks below tangible book. If you look at where the group has traditionally bottomed on a pre-provision basis, it's around a four to five multiple, and it did it in COVID and it did it during the GFC. Right now we're at 4.8 times, so we're right in that window of kind of trough valuations, which if you believe your numbers, you would say buy the group, go all in. I think that the challenge is, um, and the, I think where we could be wrong with our numbers, is the, the mix of the balance sheet. And so the non-interest bearing deposit base uh, we've seen the remixing. I think that's getting worse because of what's happened over the last 12 weeks. But we haven't seen high rates of 5% in 20 years. So the 2004 to 2006 period, we saw rates at 5%. And the, the non-interest bearing deposits are a lot lower than where they are today. And so what we're trying to do is sensitize our numbers to say, what's, what's the risk of earnings from here? And what is the valuation? What is the implied valuation on a pre-provision basis under that scenario? And if, if you can still buy banks below their long-term medians, when you fully bomb out the earnings, then you feel pretty good about it. But I don't think we're quite there yet. So while the focus was around liquidity and, and worries about credit, and that was a lot of real in the discussions, one one overhang for the group is the amount of low-yielding assets that they originated or, or purchased when rates were historically low in, in 2021. And one of the discussions we had on, on the investor panel was talking about how many of those low-yielding assets sit in banks' bond portfolios, which are dramatically underwater. And we've seen a handful of banks look to actually reposition those portfolios by selling bonds at a loss. And so one of the discussions is, should we see more institutions try to pursue that activity as they utilize the cash from those sales to pay down higher cost borrowing? So you get rid of the low yielding securities and also get real rid of, of a high cost funding. And our panelists agree that repositioning really does make sense. But the timing was really up for debate and, of course, depends on the institution's rate positioning and, most importantly, their capital. Numerous Greg Hertrick said institutions might want to wait for the operating environment to get back to a more normalized place before taking action because we're not exactly sure where rates might be over the long run. We might not be sure where regulation is over the long run. And we also expect further consolidation over the long run, and that could change the competitive landscape. But ultimately, he does expect considerable balance sheet management actions to take place. Jonah Marcus was a little bit more explicit and said as an investor, he wouldn't necessarily support repositioning where it required outside capital. But if a bank had regulatory capital on hand to take the capital hit associated with any repositioning of bond portfolios, he thinks institutions should consider doing that. The way I think about it is, if you have the regulatory capital to take the hit and have room on the back end, right now they're dinging you for the loss as if you sold it. You may as well get the benefit for the earnings that you would pick up on the other side. But more importantly, I, and so the answer to your question is yes, but more importantly to me is if you can actually take the hit that you've already recognized through book value, we're all imputing it into your regulatory capital anyway, and take that liquidity and then go play offense and bring in clients, not just lending clients, but also those that have bring deposits with them, you can really grow your client roster and your core business for what accounts to some fungible bond math. Joe, the the topic of repositioning came up on on your panel too. What did you hear from your panelist on the issue? Yes, Nathan, it, it certainly did. Bill Burgess had a similar take to Jonah Marcus and said that having capital on hand was key for any bank that was looking to pursue this. Um, Bill referenced that his firm worked with 
Eastern Bank shares on a transaction where it sold 25% of its securities portfolio at a loss, but it did so to enhance liquidity and improve future earnings. So we worked with a New England bank to restructure their securities portfolio, and we were in the midst of helping them sell a lot of securities the, s- the same week that uh, the Wednesday AK came out. And the reaction, one could argue, for that AK was pretty violent. So they were pretty worried about that. And we've talked about that in, in the session. I, I think they handled that correctly. I think they had the capital to make it work. And they, they did what we've been telling a lot of clients right now, which is if no one's asking you questions. Don't volunteer anything. Don't put an AK out. Just keep your head down. And then when you have to go through it, go through it in an intelligent manner. So I, 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 think, I think the notion of creating a capital hole and saying you're going to fill it is, is ill-advised. It's easy to say that in hindsight. I'm a fantastic Monday morning quarterback, so they, they shouldn't have done that. But I, I do think that the notion of selling securities to get yourself kind of right set for a rate environment is the right thing to do. I completely agree with John. And if you have the capital to do it, you should do it. You shouldn't raise capital to do it, but if you have the capital to do it, you should do it. So I, I think that we've been pointing to uh, the more recent uh, announcements in conjunction with earnings versus you know, saying don't ever do what with Silicon Valley Bank. It's just night and day different. Another big topic on my panel was the potential regulatory changes that might hit the banking sector in wake of the three large bank failures that occurred in the last few months. Some of those failures got the attention of lawmakers in D.C. who held some hearings to probe the demise of the banks. And those hearings certainly grabbed some headlines, but Policy expert Isaac Votansky noted that changes coming out of our divided Congress won't come quickly. Yeah, look, D.C. does two things well, nothing and overreact. <laughs> and I think that's, that's exactly what we're going to see here. Congress isn't, um, they're no longer nowhere on the deposit insurance issue. They're like in a town just down the road from nowhere. There will not be a bill to address and expand deposit insurance. It's not going to happen unless things get much, much worse. And part of the reason for that is just normal political nonsense and all that, but also just think about the way that a bill would uh, come together. You would have Democrats who say, hey, if you're addressing that, I want to also address CEO comp, right, which is a big issue in the hearings that we've heard. And the Republicans would say, hey, I also have uh, some qualms with ESG. I want to make sure that that's in there. And before you know it, it's overburdened and it falls on top of itself. Um, there are, and we can talk about this, and I hope we do, I think there are some, some red lines to be aware of, and really here we're talking about volatility in banks that have a clear political constituency. You know, I look at a bank like Regions where, look at their footprint. It's in red states and it is um, numerous states, whereas I have had staffers say to me, why are we going to do a deposit insurance bill for a couple failures of what are coastal niche banks? That's where the conversation is right now, legislatively. Um, So it's got to get much worse before you see action there. However, Isaac noted that the story is different when it comes to the regulatory agencies. On the regulatory side, this is what's wild about it. They were already gearing up to tighten the regulatory infrastructure around banks, right? We already knew they were going to go after super regional banks with the TLAC rule and the single point of entry. Now, on top of that, we're going to have Basel III finalization and then the third bucket, which we'll talk about later, which is what they're going to do to respond to this crisis. And here we're talking about AOCI and LCR and all that. That's happening. And what makes this interesting, I promise I'll shut up after this, what makes it interesting here is DC's not going from zero to 60, right? They were already starting to get a sprint because, you know, look, Vice Chair Barr from the Fed was talking about at least starting the super regional side of this to begin with. This has just given them more momentum to accomplish that. So nothing in Congress unless it gets much, much worse. Regulators are where it's at. And really the fight is going to be on implementation timeline for some of these items. When we talk about AOCI, when we talk about LCR, even stress test changes, that's where the fight is because there will be a change. It's just how long do you have from an implementation timeline. Others on the panel expressed similar viewpoints and noted that they've already seen changes during regulatory exams. Bill Burgess said regulators have begun testing banks against new liquidity ratios. The regulatory changes are are already underway. Uh, The OCC was sitting down with uh, national banks in early April, like the first week of April, with a a new ratio of uh, liquidity and cash as a percentage of uninsured deposits, a ratio that didn't exist on March 1st, and they want that ratio at 100%. Uh, so you're going to see more securitizations. I mean, they're, they're already reacting pretty aggressively uh, to what transpired, and they're not going to wait for regular way 
changes to the approaches for banks overall. So I, I, th I think they've been nimble after they got caught completely flat-footed, and, and we'll have to see how that develops over the course of the coming months. But you know, ask any OCC bank uh, in particular, and you'll see there was, a, there was a sharp change in attitude in April. And I think that was probably a good thing to get people ready for what could come. And Lou Scorman's Ben Azoff said he has seen examiners impose higher capital requirements on banks, and he's seen them turn up the heat by subjecting more banks to MRAs, which are matters requiring attention, and the more serious MOUs, which are memorandums of understanding. I mean, we're definitely seeing just a general, much like the other panel said, intensity in the regulatory environment that was starting and has definitely continued. So things that were MRAs are now, you know, you're seeing, you know, discussions of MOUs or even things like individual minimum capital requirements, which are often confidential, so you won't necessarily know that publicly. They'll be put in place so that if a bank is having, say, risk management issues or things with the regulators, they'll make them hold heightened capital, even if their capital actually objectively is okay with the concept that, you know, if there's these issues here, they need to retain more capital. And, you know, even in the environment that we've been in, we've seen all sorts of what I'll call sort of almost regulatory sort of fiats. I mean, one thing that's happened over the last month, we've seen regulators coming asking, particularly in the community bank spaces, for daily liquidity reports. I've had several clients, and again, who I'm not sure where the line is, but looking at uninsured deposits and saying, hey, we need liquidity reports. Uh, even an earnings call with the banks, getting together the, the finance team to answer the regulators' questions, almost like you'd have as an analyst, but not really. You know, questions like, why do you think your uh, stock price is down? You know, if they knew that answer, they wouldn't be, they'd be in Hawaii, right? You know? So, I, you know, a lot of questions, but a lot of fear that, that's there, and we're really seeing that in the regulatory environment right now. So we're going to see rule changes for sure, but I think even at a more granular level, you're just seeing regulators interacting with uh, the banks in ways that we just haven't seen, you know, prior to this crisis. And how long that'll continue, you know, I don't know. But it even goes so much that, you know, you take all this attention and that's even impacting M&A, like application processing, because you have case managers at the FDS, whoever, who are inundated with all of this day-to-day -day work, which they didn't have before. So it is definitely a highly unusual environment at the moment. MOUs in particular definitely come with some teeth, which I thought was pretty interesting that we're already seeing that play out even be before even new rulemaking co comes at play. And, and that was one of the things that, that played into panelists' belief that increased regulation, whether through actual policy change or even examination level, would spur more M&A activity. M&A activity is almost dormant right now. We're on pace for one of the worst quarters we've seen in terms of pace of activity since the height of COVID. But our investor, Joe DeMarcus, thought that consolidation would eventually be huge as bankers and their boards are already fatigued after the last few years and would face even greater fatigue once new regulations surface. I think consolidation on the back of this is going to be huge. I mean, we saw it on the back of COVID and the stress that people were under, and, and you saw a huge increase of, of M&A in 2021. I think this is more dramatic psychologically on boards and management teams. And I think you're just going to see a ton of consolidation. I agree with Craig. It's going to be a very small cap and micro cap phenomenon. I don't see super regionals merging. I know there's some legislation that's been at least proposed that would streamline M&A for healthy and well-capitalized banks. So I think there's some political appetite for it. I think the regulators actually generally want it. I think they'd like to have fewer banks to regulate, hopefully not through a lot of failures, but, but I, just, I think we're going to see a tremendous amount of M&A on the back of this, and, and I think it's good for shareholders, the industry, and I think, look, we know that scale continues to matter more. If anything, this enhances that. Now, that might take some time, and that was something that Jonah said, that ultimately you need the calendar to pass before we see transaction activity pick up, because right now deals remain really difficult to get done. And KBW's Chris McGrady really highlighted the issue is that the required interest rate and credit marks that buyers have to take on sellers' balance sheets serve as a major roadblock to activity at this point and really create a large capital hole that can be unsurmountable. But ultimately, he expects that to change as time passes and banks seek scale. I think putting a mark on the balance sheet is almost impossible right now. Regular way M&A feels like really difficult right now because we have the rate marks in the queues. And if you fair value, I mean, you can run, run into assumptions where the equity is, is is eliminated pretty quickly. And so I think there's uncertainty on credit marks and there's uncertainty on rate marks. So that probably means 
traditional, regular ways, not, not near term. I do think that there's different tranches of, of M&A that'll occur, right? You go back uh, 10, 15 years, or 10 years, the 50 billion was important, the 10 billion was important for Durban. Um, if you read the legislation about 100 billion kind of being, you know, where the AOCI math would get to, you know, get put in your capital, you don't want to be in no man's land. You don't want to be 90, because you're going to get regulated to 100, and you don't want to be 105 because you're bearing the cost. So there's probably a no man's land between 80 and 110 that you don't want to be in, but there's a lot of, there's a, a, a lot of banks that are in the 20s that can certainly double the company, create more scale. But I think there's, it's healthy to have competition for the, the four or five GCFAs, right? I don't think they wanted to give the, the First Republic to JP Morgan, but it was the best solution. But I think healthy competition, having a handful more of super regionals at the 500 level, I think would be, from a regulatory perspective, less of a burden. One area where we have seen some deal activity is with the recent failed bank transactions. Uh, Bill Burgess's firm, Piper Sandler, was hired by the FDIC to help shop the Silicon Valley and Signature uh, Bridge Banks that were created in the aftermath of, of their failures. Uh, Burgess said he was impressed by the FDIC, but he was surprised by the lack of interest from potential buyers, particularly since the Fell Bank deals don't require the same long regulatory approval process that the open bank transactions do. I was, was brought into the, the boardroom at, at Piper Sandler on, at 5 o'clock on, on Sunday after uh, Silicon Bank had, had failed, and they let us know about Signature as well. And they were trying to get that done the next week. It ended up taking two weeks. You know, I'll give the FDIC credit for you know, kind of rallying at, at 7 o'clock on Thursday and then kind of sound the alarm bell. So they, they were caught flat-footed. They tried to get it sold that weekend. They failed. And then they, they brought in some, some folks to help. We, we had manpower. We had... Uh, the ability to, to stand up quickly and, and, and try to find a way to get the buyers organized. What I was surprised with, I think, in terms of the first week was how difficult it was to get regional banks to pay attention. You know, one, of the, one of the thoughts that has been going through my mind in terms of regional bank consolidation is that it has been just a, uh, a very painful exercise. Ask U.S. Bank how much fun it was to spend a year trying to get Union Bank closed, or Bank of Montreal to stand in front of Congress and, and talk about why they should be able to close Bank of the West. Or hell, even, even Truist, way back when, um, had some issues. And what TD had to pay for a, a ransom and fail to get First Horizon closed it was astonishing to me. And so I'm talking to these, these same large banks saying, I can have this closed for you on Sunday. Sunday. You, don't have, you can go see Liz Warren if you want to. You don't, you don't have to. It can close in days. And we really didn't have anyone who was paying attention. Now, that may be because First Republic was going on in parallel. They never told us what was going on there. And the FDIC what was remarkably adept at kind of compartmentalizing the, the ongoing, uh, ongoing processes. But I'll, I'll tell you this. The, the FDIC, you know, they basically said, we need help. Uh, we got caught flat-footed. And over the course of the next couple of weeks, they got up to speed very quickly. And they were looking at every possible bank that could fail. There were data rooms built on every one of them. They were not going to get caught flat-footing again. And I was, I was incredibly impressed with how talented the teams were particularly in, in D.C. Because in order for us to, to sell these two companies, we needed liquidity facilities that appro approximated a quarter trillion dollars. Now, the discussions to get the okay to back up these balance sheets went all the way to the White House because they were concerned about the debt ceiling. Pretty sure I haven't had a lot of debt ceiling discussions with, with my M&A history. Um, <laughs> but $60 billion of unfunded commitments at Silicon Valley Who's, who's going to fund that? A bank doesn't have that kind of liquidity. Well, one of the super regionals told me, he said, look, Bill, if we buy this and we have $42 billion leave on Monday, the same way it happened in Silicon Valley, then I'm on your list. It turns out self-preservation is, is one of the characteristics of most CEOs and CFOs. They, they, they don't want to kill themselves. So all of this, all of this um, required liquidity in terms of backup facilities and the like was put together by some incredibly talented people. And those guys were working around the clock. So, you know, see what you will about the regulators and, and kind of you know, they're, they're docksiders and they're, they're, they're khakis from Marshalls. But they, they worked their asses off, and they were incredibly, incredibly adept at what they were doing. I, I, was, I was really surprised and, and impressed. I don't know if we'll have a chance to work with them again, because I think they've kind of got uh, their feet beneath them. But, but that was a learning experience, and it was really, I was impressed with, with how focused they were on trying to find 
uh, solution. I guess the last thing I'd say, too, is, is they absolutely do not want to fail any more banks um, over the course of the coming weeks. And that may surprise a few folks. And we're working with a couple right now that are, the FDIC is, is not, not going to shock you. They're, they're on site with some of these banks trying to see what the deposit outflows are every single day. And, and they're looking at CNBC and the panic porn of, of who's going to fail next. But they do not want to fail these banks. And they will do all that they possibly can to facilitate a sale or a capital raise uh, to avoid any more hits to the diff. And so I, I've been impressed with how they, they pivoted and how they're now going about trying to find uh, orderly resolutions for institutions that are, are, are kind of uh, in extremis right now. But ultimately, Burgess does think the current interest rate environment and the potential regulatory changes will spur more bank M&A activity down the road because it just means that there will be more pressure on bank earnings going forward. All of this is just terrible in terms of bank profitability. All of this is going to be more liquidity, more capital, more expenses, lower returns. You know, as an M&A banker, I think that's absolutely fantastic because it's going to mean that all the smaller banks that were earning 12% on capital or earning 10% on capital are going to be forced to run for the exits. We only need 4,300 banks in the country. But it'll take some time to get there. But, but all of this is, is kind of horrible with respect to just profitability for banks overall. We're going to see margins. I think margins have, have, have already topped, frankly. And we'll see how that unfolds in the next uh, few, few quarters. But I mean, everything, everything about this is, is kind of unfortunate, particularly for banks that are below, call it $5 billion, $1 million of assets. They're, they're really going to suffer. Uh, they, don't, they don't have the scale. And we'll have to see how this uh, M&A cycle restarts and when it does. It, it, it could be by the end of the year. It's, it's probably next year post-credit uh, when, once we find out what's going to happen in, in terms of the economy. Well, Joe, at the end of the day, it, it seemed like most of our panelists thought that the current market environment where hysteria is ruling the day is misplaced, but it's going to be some tough sledding for banks sort of in the near term, and that time will ultimately get us to the other side where we could see a big pickup in M&A activity and, and more transaction activity in bank land. Yes, Nathan, I think you summed it up well, and I'm sure there's a lot of investment bankers out there who are hoping to see a bank M&A pick up, but um in the meantime, you know, we thank you for your insights here, and, um, and that'll do it for this episode of The Pipeline.